Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Assigning Students to Appropriate Intervention. Uh, my name is Matt Hanstein, and I work on the Early Warning System team here at the National High School Center. I'm joined today by my colleagues Jenny Scala and Laura Yurhat, also with the EWS team at the National High School Center. Today's presentation will have two parts. In the first, Jenny will provide a brief presentation on how to um, assign students to appropriate interventions. Following her presentation, Jenny, Laura, and myself will take questions and answers through the uh, Early Warning System Community of Practice uh, at community.betterhighschools.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Jenny. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, as Matt said, today's focus is on step five of the Early Warning Intervention and Monitoring System, which is assigning and providing interventions. On the National High School Center's webpage, we have archived prior webinars that focus on the first four steps of this process. And step five, you've looked at your data already that you've generated through the Early Warning System tool, and now that you've learned who and what students have, are being flagged, you're able to take a few steps broader to then say, okay, looking at what students are flagged, how are we then going to assign and provide appropriate interventions to students? This allows us to also look at information about root causes um, for students who are flagged as, a, as at risk, and then also to make sure that there's a good match between what interventions or instructional supports that we're providing based on how students are flagged. We often get asked questions about what interventions or instructional supports are the best or what supports and, and programs people should be using. And really, today's webinar is going to provide a brief overview of some ways of looking at different points of information to help you make the best decisions. I liken this presentation to a consumer reports because what we're going to be doing is giving you a lot of questions that you can use with your early warning system um, an intervention and monitoring system team later on to make the best decisions about what interventions to use. Often a lot of our schools and districts and states that we're working with are also using a um, multi-tiered system of support as a framework to help look at how to support all students. And this slide will look really familiar to many people in terms of looking at a three-tiered or our response to instruction, response to intervention, and a multi-tiered system of prevention in how students can be provided services. The one thing that I want to add and just draw your attention to quickly in this slide is this vertical triangle that cuts through all three levels. And we use this triangle to identify students who are receiving English language, who are English language learners or students who are receiving um, special education services, noting that they receive services at any or all levels of this multi-tiered system depending on their need. So as I said, we often get asked questions about how to choose interventions. And we've broken this process down into almost three kind of big categories that you need to think about when you're selecting your interventions. And the first is identifying your needs and your priorities. And oftentimes people skip this step and they'll use and implement other interventions that they've heard of, um, other people having success with, or just that they've heard a lot of talk about. But we really encourage people to take the time to identify your needs and your priorities to make sure that the interventions or the instructional supports that you choose have a good match between the needs of your students and the priorities within the school. Within the early warning system tool, you're getting data and your indicators are providing you data on course performance, attendance data, and behavior data. And so these might be ways and topics that you look at in terms of looking at your needs and your priorities for your students. So first, when you're thinking about identifying your needs, you want to be clear about what skills you're trying to address when you're choosing your instructional program. What grades do we want this to be focused on? Is there a specific subgroup that we want to be focused on? Again, these are just a few questions that you might want to ask yourself when you're defining and identifying your specific needs for your students. There's also additional questions about your needs that you can generate while looking at those various reports that Matt has highlighted on a prior webinar. 
in looking at your priorities within the school, you want to look in terms of the program some different characteristics. First of all, is it a reasonable cost? What's the time frame for implementation? Are there requirements for specialized expertise? Is there a lengthy training in terms of administering and learning the different program? What are the technical training and support that's provided? And what evidence has been done that really looks at the efficacy of the most rigorous research for those programs? So to help you understand how, how confident can you be in the results that the research is providing on these programs so that when you're implementing them, you're most likely to get the results mirrored that the researchers got when they were researching the program. As well as, is there demonstrative effectiveness other places in our district or in our state that we can look at? So these are some other priorities that you might want to think about when you're choosing your interventions and selections. We highlight these areas in terms of identifying needs and priorities. As I said previously, many schools that are implementing tiered supports and are looking at assigning and selecting interventions skip this important process of getting clarity on the needs and looking at your priorities. And therefore, when they're just selecting interventions, they might have different results than that they would expect to get because they're not really clear on what their needs are. Once you've identified your needs and your priorities, that's when you then start to look at the evidence claims that have been provided by different organizations and different research publications. I'm going to provide just a few slides highlighting some ways of thinking about how you can go about evaluating evidence claims. First of all, we'd like to point out that sometimes there can be different definitions that are associated with evidence-based interventions and research-based interventions. We want you to understand that there can be differences around how these terms are used and that it's important to know that if people are defining them differently, what that might mean for you and your team of how you select these various implement interventions and instructional programs. Commonly, evidence-based interventions have been empirically validated through scientific rigorous research designs of the overall program that's been identified, whereas research-based interventions may have certain aspects of the design that have been rigorously researched, but have not done a holistic rigorous research design on the entire program or the entire instructional support. So research-based interventions have aspects that have been researched generally, whereas evidence-based interventions, the entire program has been rigorously researched. So keep that in mind. And also, as you're starting to look at different pieces of information about these instructional programs, it's really important to dig a little bit deeper about different terminology that's often um, shared for users. So where can we get some information about how to evaluate evidence? Well, there's lots of different places. Um, the curriculum website, so if you're using or if you're looking at a packaged um, curriculum program, those curriculum websites will provide information about the different inter interventions and instructional programs. Peer-reviewed journals often have evaluation reports or reports talking about research that's been done on different programs and different interventions. The What Works Clearinghouse, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, Doing What Works, the National Dropout Prevention Center Network, as well as the National High School Center are all also websites where you can get information about various evidence around different programs. And these different websites have different terminology that I just talked about before in terms of different types of research as well as other various aspects in terms of what programs they reviewed and what process they used in terms of reviewing that. But it's important to know that there are multiple sites of where you can look for information about various programs. In terms of quality, once we get our research and we have it in front of us, we want to be able to determine what's the quality of this research. So some overarching questions that we can ask as we look through this research was about the program implementation. So thinking about how this was implemented in the research study, is it realistic for me and my school or my district to, think, to, to believe that we would have the time, the resources, um, the technology, whatever else is necessary to also be able to look at how it was implemented. So when you're looking specifically at the research, 
Some questions that you can ask and look at was, well, who implemented the intervention? Was there a manual or a script that was provided to help people? How often did the intervention occur? Was there fidelity checks done? So what strength do we know that as people were implementing the intervention and the program, it was implemented as it was originally designed? And then what phase of research? So was this more of an exploration in terms of learning about this different program? Was it a pilot where there's more information but people are still more at the beginning stages? Or is this more of a scale-up or an efficacy study where we're really fairly confident in what the research says about this program or this intervention and we're confirming some of our, our research that's been done elsewhere? So it's important to look at the quality of your evidence as well. And then making sure that your desired outcomes that were assessed are relevant to your needs. And again, this is where it's important to take the time, that first area in terms of looking at your identified needs and your identified priorities. So if we're looking at this research that we have on a specific intervention program, we want to say, well, what were those specific outcome measures that were used to evaluate the interventions? Did the outcome measures seem reasonable? And are the outcome measures reliable and valid? Then there's this aspect that's really important that I'm really only going to touch a little bit on today, which is around the effects. So as research has been done, we are given information about if the effects are large enough or are they meaningful in terms of the research and how the research is shared out. So there can be important things for you to be aware of as you're looking through the research around the significance of the differences within the research. Generally, research literature identifies effect sizes that are 0.80 or greater as large effects. Moderate effects are around 0.50, and then small effects are 0.2 to 0.3, generally. However, some people will say that, that they might change the definition or what they consider to be a moderate effect size might not be consistent across different researchers and different organizations. So again, it's important to make sure that you look a little bit deeper around what those effect sizes are as well. So keep in mind the interpretation of those effect sizes as researchers report whether or not an effect size was large or the effect um, was large or moderate or medium or to small as well. And as you look at different websites, different websites have a different interpretation of what would be considered a large uh, effect as well. So again, these are some things to think about as you move forward and looking at the research. Another aspect that you want to look at in this research is the population. So what population was the evidence show that there was an effect? So is this sample population described? So can you explicitly tell who was studied in this research? And then you want to say, well, is this participant sample similar or representative of your own student population? Without having a match between your own population and the research sample size, you might not get the full effect of what you would think you would get based on the research. So you want to make sure that this population of who the research was done with, that this population sample is similar or representation of, representative of your own student population. Also looking at the population, are there different effects for different population groups? Um, so you want to think about this information. Some research publications or some websites might not report down to this level of information on the population, but generally you will be able to get information about the type of participant um, population that was done for the research. And you want to make sure that you look at that as you're trying to discern what, what type of interventions to look at. We shared these number of slides that talk with these different questions. Um, as a way to help you think about how to make the best decisions for you when you're choosing your interventions or your instructional programs. We often use a comparison to when you go shopping for cars. If you're going to go car shopping, you generally have some clear questions that you want to ask. You've done some research elsewhere, so you're going in with information about what the um, average mile per gallon that cars get You've got some safety information. You might have gone to various websites as well for different costs so that you have this type of information when you go in and you're looking to buy cars. You also have information when you're buying cars, going back to your needs and your priorities. 
how and what you look at in terms of if you're choosing a car that's better suited for four-wheel drive versus a car that you're going to use as strictly as a commuting car, that's different in terms of what then your needs and your priorities would be. And it's the same type of idea when you're thinking about choosing different instructional programs. You want to be clear on your needs and your priorities. And then these other questions that we've just shown you provide some follow-up questions that you can use in your group as you're looking at the reviews of the research. And then once you've evaluated the evidence claims, you're then going to go ahead and choose which instructional program to use, and you're going to go ahead and implement it. The National High School Center is not allowed to endorse or recommend any specific interventions, which is why we came up with this series of slides talking about different ways of thinking about the best supports for you and the ways of looking at research so that as you're reviewing various research on different instructional programs, you can make the most informed decisions for your school and your needs. When you are implementing your practices, you want to Obviously, most programs um, come with some initial training and professional development. You want to make sure that that's provided. You want to make sure that you're also planning for initial implementation so that you've got the appropriate schedule based on what the instructional program is, is suggesting and that there's additional the, uh, the right materials and right equipment that's necessary as well. As you can, we all know that providing ongoing coaching and professional development is very beneficial, particularly as we are starting up providing a new support. Uh, and then you want to make sure that you're evaluating and monitoring the fidelity of implementation. And I'll talk more about fidelity of implementation in a little bit. Or right now. And I apologize, we've, we've shortened this to follow into our, our time frame that we have today. There's a lot more information that we can provide about these. If you have follow-up questions, please join us in the chat in a little bit and we can provide more information. We highlight monitoring fidelity in this presentation because we want to make sure that as we're, as we're implementing our additional instructional support and program, that we have the confidence in our results so that we can say, you know what, We've monitored this, we've implemented it, it's working or it's not working. And if it's not working, the first question that we're probably going to ask us ourselves is, well, are we implementing it as it was designed? And the best way that we can make sure and monitor for that fidelity is to measure it. And there's three broad topics, or not topics, but ways of thinking about monitoring fidelity. And you'll see those three here. We're going to go through each of those later on. So the first one that we'll talk about is self-report data. The general types of self-report data are this questionnaires or surveys. And what this provides us is some information about teacher knowledge and a little bit of the context about how teachers are implementing things. However, Generally, when self-report data is used alone, it's slightly unreliable, not because we're trying to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but it's just that we often aren't able to monitor what we're saying in a, real, in, in a clear way. I might think that I've implemented something as it was intended or that I've actually followed the script, but it's hard for me if I'm just doing my own kind of questionnaire to really notice if I'm veering off of that script or if I'm changing things in ways that's a little bit beyond what the, um, the program was intending for it to be designed around. Through observations is another common way to monitor fidelity. This means that we are ending up developing checklists that has identified the critical implementation components. Oftentimes, um, package curriculum will do this for us in terms of identifying what those critical components are. Some ways that we can do this observation would be through recording and then listening to sessions randomly. We can also conduct spot checks. We could have peer observations. And we could also provide peer coaching, which would get at this observation and would make sure that we have the opportunity to see how staff are doing around implementing the instructional program as it was designed and intended. One of the benefits of doing the observation is that we do have that opportunity for some dialogue afterwards, and yet one of the challenges is often, often finding the time, making sure that everyone's been trained sufficiently on if you are conducting observations, what they're conducting observations on, what to look for, 
and making sure that there's staff time to allow for those observations. Logs, reviewing logs, lesson plans, and student work allows us to evaluate what content was covered and also allows us to monitor student progress to see how far students have come um, and if that is a positive trajectory for students. However, just reviewing these logs, lesson plans, and student work provides less information about the delivery, which might be specific if there is a specific um, se sequence that things have to be delivered. Um, as well as we get less information around dosage. And then if there is a script, it's sometimes harder to determine whether or not there's been uh, adherence to the script. As I said when I started this section, this is a very brief overview about how to assign and provide interventions for students. As we provide more information later on, um, we will be having an opportunity for more information later on through our chat that we're going to go to next. And these slides will be archived for you. We recommend that you definitely look at the sections around evaluating the um, evidence claims. Those questions that are on those slides can be very helpful for staff as they're choosing appropriate interventions. I'm going to hand it back to Matt now. Great. Thanks, Jenny. As we've mentioned, today's webinar is the fourth in a series of five webinars um, that we've been doing in October and November. The fifth and final webinar will be um, Tuesday, November 27th, and we encourage you to join us. You can register through our website, betterhighschools.org. Also on our website are recordings of the previous three webinars if you weren't able to attend, and this webinar will also be archived there. Some additional resources, the community of practice, which we'll be going to for the live chat in just a minute, community.betterhighschools.org. Our website, betterhighschools.org, which has free downloadable copies of the EWS tools that you've seen throughout this series of the collators tools that Laura showed you in the second, series, in the second webinar, uh, implementation guide, and other things. And finally, you can contact the Early Warning System team at EWS at betterhighschools.org. Additionally, you can follow the National High School Center through Twitter, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit our blog, blog.betterhighschools.org. Now we're going to move into the live chat. In order to access the live chat, simply go to the community of practice, community.betterhighschools.org, and log in with your username and password. In the middle of the screen, you'll see a uh, graphic with two chat bubbles that says um, EWS Live Chat. Click on that to be taken into the live chat. We hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us.